You see, a lot of folks in peak oil tend to think, you know, we're, we're coming on a utopia. Yeah, things will be hard, but, you know, the fossil fuels will disappear and we're going to a renewable future and it's all going to happen automatically. The oil companies have other plans for us. This is Peak Moment. We are living at a peak of human innovation, information, wealth, and health. But we're also at a peak of population and consumption, with rising temperatures and declining resources fueled by cheap oil and gas. Peak Moment Television, bringing you examples of positive responses to energy decline and climate change through local community action. Hi, welcome to Peak Moment. I'm Jenea Donaldson. I'm in the town of Santa Cruz and I'm talking with David Bloom, the author of Alcohol Can Be a Gas, which is a great title, <laughs> a forthcoming book, yes, a reprinted it, book. Yes, absolutely. So we were talking, I want to continue our talk about the emissions that alcohol has compared to, say, petroleum or coal or something else. Yeah, you know, alcohol uh, gets, gets dinged by some of the pundits in the media saying, well, you know, uh, for every... 20, for every gallon of gasoline, you get 20 pounds of carbon dioxide. And from alcohol, you know, every gallon of alcohol produces 20 pounds of carbon dioxide. So where's the big benefit? Well, the big benefit is both in carbon dioxide and in the other emissions. You see, unlike gasoline, the whole process of making alcohol is a biological one. So plants take carbon dioxide from the air. You know, plants, when they do photosynthesis, breathe in carbon dioxide, right. use the carbon, and breathe out the oxygen. So when you go ahead and make alcohol, uh, you're using you know, that carbon dioxide and sunlight to produce the fuel. When you burn it in the car, the carbon dioxide and water that are what alcohol is made of go back to the air, but the sunlight that was trapped by that plant as a carbohydrate drives the car down the road. Okay. So the carbon dioxide that goes out the exhaust pipe is the same amount of carbon dioxide needed to grow next year's crop of alcohol. Gasoline doesn't have that equivalent. Okay. You see, when you burn that gasoline, you're burning millions of years old algae, and there's nothing there to absorb the CO2 that is being thrown into the atmosphere. And hence, we get our global warming, because we're taking all of that stored up carbon dioxide, carbon. Yes, and putting and it into the air. Suddenly. And uh, the other thing that's important that people don't realize about global warming is that water vapor is a global gas. And when you burn the hydrocarbons in, in gasoline, uh, you get an awful lot of water vapor in addition. So the water vapor and the carbon dioxide are a double whammy oh. from, uh, from petroleum fuels that we don't have with alcohol because both those things are absorbed by plants next year. But actually, plants reverse global warming because the corn, for instance, the grain of the corn, well, that's you know part of the plant. For every pound of corn that we turn into alcohol, there's two and a half pounds of stalk and three and a half pounds of roots. And that plants take excess carbon dioxide and go ahead and pump that into the soil in the form of mm -hmm. sugar to feed life in the soil. So, it, you know, the amount that we use to make the alcohol is a tip of the CO2 absorbing iceberg that reduces and re removes global warming. So what you're saying warming. is that plant is taking in even more carbon dioxide than the amount that we're going to take out for the, for the alcohol. That's right. So the other emissions are really important, too. You know, we, uh, you know the three big emissions that that gasoline produces are carbon monoxide, um, hydrocarbons, and nitrous oxides. So these are the three big pollutants. Carbon monoxide is extremely toxic. Uh, you know, and basically, I can think of examples like in the bottom of the Grand Canyon where people are running motorboats up and down. People have actually uh, fainted and died from the carbon dioxide settling, settling in the bottom of the river carbon basin. Carbon monoxide down there. Yeah. Yes. And so does alcohol have that kind of? Alcohol actually is used to remove or reduce the carbon monoxide in gasoline. In oh, California, okay. we add 6% alcohol to all the gasoline to reduce the carbon monoxide by 50%. Okay. But when you run alcohol pure by itself, you have 99% reduction in carbon monoxide down to zero in many cases. Uh, you, when it comes to nitrous oxides, over 99% reduction in nitrous oxides, okay. and hydrocarbons often are zero on alcohol. So, for instance, when I take my Ford Ranger into the uh, smog testing station in California, I come up with all zeros when I'm running on alcohol. But uh, actually, um, in many cases, alcohol will actually take pollutants that are currently in the air and burn them in the engine, and the exhaust comes out cleaner than the air going in. Yes, yes. So, so alcohol is extremely clean compared to any other fossil fuel. Probably the only thing that's 
cleaner when it burns is hydrogen, but almost everything we use to make hydrogen produces pollution. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, so mm -hmm, ultimately, mm -hmm. alcohol is far cleaner. I want to ask where you think the world's going to go as peak oil hits us and we've got declining supplies. I just, since, since that's part of why alcohol has got to fit in here somewhere. Well, the first thing I would like to say is that we are in peak oil right now. And I, I can give you, you know, what I call functional peak oil has already occurred, meaning that we are already producing less oil each year than we did the year before. Yes. And that started in 2003 in November. OPEC cut its production 3% to see what would happen. And that's the equivalent of taking 1% off the world market because they're about a third of the world market. Okay. So they stood back and nobody replaced their production. So that, well, uh, maybe that was a fluke. Maybe there were some refineries down. Maybe there was some reason for this because, you know, they left money on the table and no one picked it up. So in February 2004, they dropped production 10%. So that's a 3% in world production drop. Okay. All right. And they stood back and said, okay, who's going to pick up the money? And no one did. So the reality was that we are already pumping at full capacity, refining at full capacity, and there is no reserve capacity. So, yes, we might have a 1% to 3% you know, um, cushion, but that's virtually nothing. Yeah. And so we are already in peak oil and going down the other side. And you got to realize people have changed the definition of petroleum to hide peak oil. Natural gas condensates, which are toxic materials that are condensed out of natural gas, are now added to the oil and called conventional oil. That's not oil. It's from natural gas. I didn't realize that. Oh, yes. Uh, when you look at the, the famous Exxon chart a few years ago that shows peak oil hitting in 2010, you read the fine print and you'll find out that the top slice of petroleum is actually natural gas condensates and a much worse material, tar sands. Yes, yes. So right. tar sands are now our largest imported source of oil, even greater than Saudi Arabia's oil. So, and we get that from Canada, which is one of the things that will happen during peak oil. You see, a lot of folks in peak oil tend to think, you know, we're, we're coming on a utopia. Yeah, things will be hard, but, you know, the fossil fuels will disappear and we're going to a renewable future and it's all going to happen automatically. The oil companies have other plans for us. And if we don't actively advocate for renewables, we're going to get those other plans. And one of them is tar sands. When you produce tar sands and make oil from it, you get the equivalent of 20 units of carbon dioxide for every unit of oil produced oh, because okay. they have to melt that tar to be able to pump it yeah. out of the ground. So they have to use an enormous amount of natural gas to right. heat up the tar sands, right. and that just gushes CO2 into the atmosphere. So that is... And so that's want, horrible. That um, and then you start looking at uh, the next big one, which is oil shale. Now, oil shale is not as easy to extract as tar sands. It's a rock that's full of carrageen, and so they have to grind it up. They have to burn it in big underground caverns, and then they spray enormous amounts of water on it to capture the oily vapor and then separate the oil to, to use. So now... So, so I'm going to interrupt you. So the oil companies are, want us to go to these non-traditional, non-conventional oil sources, which are going to be much more expensive well, and they, much more polluting. Absolutely. They're much more polluting, they, and especially from a climate point of view. You're looking at, you know, 10 to 20 times as much carbon dioxide as, as oil production, which doesn't really produce a lot of carbon dioxide. So what, that, what has to happen for them to make those things economical is oil has to be over $100 a barrel. And we're heading there. And if, you know, the only way that they can make that stick is if we don't get the alternatives online so that they're the only answer. And there's other bad, bad choices. For instance, coal to liquid right, uh, right. technologies right. are cr incredibly climate destroying. So what I'm trying to say is that we can't stand back and say when oil disappears, we'll automatically they go, go to, to renewables because it isn't automatic. It We're going to automatic. have to push for it. We have to do it ourselves. It. Which actually gets to me the question of alcohol production, right? Back to Thomas Edison saying the car for the farmers, right? Because we had alcohol production everywhere on all the farms, which we don't have now, probably. We, but it's changing. How does that, what is that outlook for the for production, do we have to have the big refineries, if you will, for alcohol? Could we have it in our neighborhood? I mean, what's possible? Well, there are several questions wrapped up in that. One of them is, can we actually make enough alcohol? And the, the pundits say, oh, no, if you take all the corn in the United States, you can only replace 15% of the gasoline. Yeah, for our gasoline usage. And then there's the other argument that you can only do this in really enormous plants of 100 million gallons per year, and, you know, small-scale production doesn't make sense. So let me kind of go after both of those questions. 
Can we make enough? Yes, it's true that if we turned corn into alcohol, you know, and, and then used the byproduct for feed, we'd only replace 15% of the gasoline. And that is totally irrelevant because if you take a look at the United States, we have two kinds of agriculturally class soil. One is called cropland, which is the prime super good soil. We have 500 million acres of that, half a billion acres. Okay. We have another billion acres of what we call farmland, which is good stuff, but it's not quite as level, not quite as good mm -hmm. as the cropland. So we have 1,500 million acres of corn. And I'm putting it that way so we can understand of, of this. Of corn. I'm no, not, sorry, of, not corn. Of um, farmland. Farmland. Okay. What we have in corn is only 70 million acres of corn. So out of 1,500 million acres, we only have 70 million acres in corn. That's 5% roughly. Okay. So... We're only, got, we're only using 5% of our land to grow corn. The rest of that land is largely used in wasteful ways like grazing cattle, et cetera, because literally there's no market for anything we could produce on mm -hmm, that land. Mm -hmm, We've mm -hmm. already, we're already awash in corn and soybeans. If we started producing energy, we would look at many different crops. We wouldn't be sticking with corn, and we have all this land to work with. So let's say we're talking about colder northern areas. We can use fodder beets, which is a beet similar to sugar beets, but it's like 15 pounds. And we can get over 1,000 gallons of acre from fodder beets compared wow. to 300 gallons an acre from corn, and it makes superior animal feed. If we're looking at dry areas like the southwest, right. you know, we already have 70 million acres of mesquite trees scattered throughout the, the southwest, mostly not even on farmland, and that's the same amount of land as we have in corn. And the pods, the sugary pods that hang from the trees, actually would produce just as much alcohol per acre as corn, but with no chemical input, no irrigation, no nothing, and it's already growing. I was there. just saying, you've got the you've got the plants there, and we can plant lots more of it because it's a very generous, willing plant. Um, just to keep putting in perspective how much we can produce, we have 30 million acres of lawn in the United States. That's almost half as much land as we have in corn. Yes, and. We use more fertilizer on our lawn than we use on the corn. The grass clippings can be made into alcohol. You know, any kind of cellulosic material, uh, now that gasoline has gotten expensive enough, can be made into alcohol economically. Wood chips. Wood chips, green waste from all of our cities, uh, and we can actually grow plantations of cellulose, you know, fast-growing trees like willow, or uh, in my book I profile many different mm -hmm. crops. Mm -hmm. Um, where we're looking at instead of 1,000 gallons an acre, 2,500, 3,500. Okay. Or in okay. the case of my favorite example is cattails. Cattails, lowly weed, nobody thinks much of it, grows in marshy places, of which there's a lot in the United States. Cattails uh, are also used for treating sewage. The many rural communities cannot afford big sewage treatment mm -hmm. plants, and mm -hmm. so they run the partially treated sewage into marshes, full of cattails, yeah. and they suck up all the nutrients out of the water, and at the other end, that water is almost safe to drink. Wow. It's that good of a biological cleaner. Okay. Grown in that nutrient-rich environment, um, each county in the United States would only use 6,400 acres to produce all the alcohol fuel that that county would use, and that's a small fraction of the size of the U average U.S. county. So we could solve several problems. We could treat our sewage completely, we could produce from the cattails all the starch we need to produce all the alcohol locally, and that would only be about 50 or 60 million gallons per county. Now, big numbers, how do you make sense of that? The average alcohol plant in the Midwest is 50 to 100 million gallons per okay. year right now. So this okay. is a scale we understand. All right. Uh, but we also can be looking at many other scales that make sense. And... The way we need to understand this is not looking at alcohol as a single product. It's part of an ecological complex of biorefining. So we can take, uh, let's say we'll just use corn for a minute and talk about other crops that are possible. If you take the corn and you make alcohol with it, okay. that's one product. Okay. But all that dried distiller's grains, the leftover mm -hmm. protein and fat that you know did not ferment, we can now say feed the tilapia, which are fish. fish. Now, fish are very efficient at turning food into meat. One and a half pounds of feed makes a pound of fish. With cattle, it takes 10 pounds of corn to make a pound uh -huh. of cow. All right. So we can make an awful lot of food with the corn instead of feeding it to cattle and wasting it in the right. manure. And then you will go ahead and take the water that the fish have been pooping in, and you can go ahead and use some of that to produce spirulina, 
which is a very fast growing uh, algae like mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. bacteria, and that can feed actually a lot more fish. But you can also take the fish water and use it to grow human food, uh, you know, like high value vegetables mm -hmm. and other important mm -hmm. crops. Mm -hmm. um, and we can use the carbon dioxide that the yeast breathe out while they are fermenting the alcohol because plants need carbon dioxide. So we can use the carbon dioxide in the fields and triple yields because plant growth is limited by the amount of CO2 in the air. So if we give it... Get even more CO2. We can give it the captured wow. CO2 wow. and capture that, not put it into the air where it bothers right. with global warming, and immediately reuse it. So we're talking about solving food, fuel, and energy. So let's put it in perspective. In the United States, we've spent getting over $300 billion now in Iraq. We use 160 billion gallons of fuel in the United States every year. Okay. Now, to build an alcohol plant costs, very conveniently, about a dollar per gallon of capacity. So you want a 100 million gallon plant, costs 100 million bucks. Okay. So if we want to replace all the oil in the United States for transportation, it would only cost us $160 billion worth of alcohol plants. Half of. Half of what we've spent in Iraq so far. If we wanted to replace the entire world's use of petroleum for fuel, that's a half a billion gallons a year. That's the same amount of money we spend each year on our defense budget. If we took one year's spending of our defense budget, we could permanently replace all the fuel production in the entire world using plant-based products and stop global warming almost overnight and now if you've got countries that have all the energy that they could possibly right, use, right. all the food they could possibly use, what's left to fight over? <laughs> what's there left to do? I'm going to, in our last 10 minutes, I want to get down to our local and personal levels. Right? I want to know then, you're talking, can we do a small production plant in our communities? Absolutely. It would think so. From any of those the cellulosic or sugar wastes, right? Well, is it, is it techn known technology? We're talking moonshining here. This is mankind's second oldest profession. We know how to do this. <laughs> so uh, a still that's about the size of your car, for instance, a very small still. Okay. Uh, and this is a scale that we talk about in the book, that it's even practical down to this scale. That still could produce 100 gallons every three days because it takes three days for fermentation. Okay, okay. So that's 9,000 gallons a year. Well, that's enough to fuel about 20 people's worth of cars. So even on that scale, uh, it makes economic sense. Sure. You can make alcohol from waste products for about 30 cents a gallon. My favorite used to be, for instance, donuts. I used to, you know, cops can only eat so many, and then they have to throw them away, you know. So I would take the, the day-old donuts that would be thrown away from our local bakeries, and I would go ahead and cook those down to make alcohol. But, of course, donuts have sugar, yeah. pure starch, right. and fat because they're fried. So when we go to cook it down, the fat would float on the top. We'd skim that off and use it to fire the still. <laughs> and, you know, doing it that way, we made alcohol for about 20 cents a gallon, you know. So, you know, on the small scale, there are a lot of waste products that we could take out of uh -huh. the waste stream okay. and make okay. alcohol with. But that little 9,000 gallon per year operation, if it took it, if it did it with corn and it took the dried distiller's grains and say first grew oyster mushrooms, using mm -hmm, that mm -hmm, as the mm -hmm, raw material, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then took the byproduct from growing the oyster mushrooms and fed it to the tilapia, and then took okay, the... Okay, I mean, you're talking multiple income streams here from all of those useful products. That's right, and that's the way you need to think in business. You can't just use a product and throw it away. That's yeah, the old yeah, way of doing yeah, business. Yeah. So every, every byproduct, every surplus in your operation, this is what we say in permaculture, there's no waste... There's only a surplus we haven't designed to use for mm -hmm, yet. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we, we cycle it you know, through the fish, back into vegetables, etc. And now you're looking at alcohol being the least valuable part of that whole complex of businesses. Right, right. And so now we start talking about instead of how many uh, acres per job, you know, we talk about how many jobs per mm -hmm, acre mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. all these value-added businesses can make quite a bit of sense in a good design. So even a small, you know, 9,000 gallon per year alcohol operation could literally gross over $200,000 a year and net about half of that. That's a good small That's business. Good, yes, indeed. If you can, businesses. And if you can make that work on the small scale, you can make it work all the way up. Now you think, okay, Dave, that's some kind of 80s hippie kind of, you know, Dr. Atomic kind of, you know, uh, uh, fantasy. I dream, yes. Well, I would point, I would point then 
at a, a place to verify this is Archer Daniels Midland, fourth biggest grain company in the United States. And in Decatur, Illinois, they have five acres of greenhouses where they take the dried distiller's grains, they feed it to tilapia. Okay, so they're doing it. They're doing, they're doing it. it. And they take the tilapia and deliver them, still swimming, live, in tank trucks to restaurants all over the East Coast on trucks running on biodiesel. If they can do it at that scale, we can do it on the small scale in our local communities. So I'm going to pull back to, 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 a, to a previous discussion. If we want to have alcohol... In our, in our communities. I mean, it's already being produced, even not even thinking about production. Billions of gallons. How do we even begin to do that? Well, as we talk about in the book. And I want to talk about, how, I mean, we got about six minutes. Yes. Converting our cars. What do we have to do to, make, to be able to run on alcohol until we get alcohol-designed vehicles? Well, luckily, your car pretty much is almost there already. Uh, basically, there are a couple of ways we go about running cars on alcohol. If you don't buy one that's already flexible mm -hmm. fuel from the factory, able to run on both. And right. those are you know, more widely available all the time. Uh, basically, we trick the computer with different fooler technologies into thinking it's running on gasoline when it's running on alcohol. Alcohol needs less air than gasoline mm. to burn, so mm -hmm. we have to change the air-fuel mixture. Okay. And we go over several ways in the book to using simple devices to, to trick the car. Or there are kits available from Brazil because, again, Brazil, 40% of the cars run on alcohol there, and people convert their cars using $300 kits that they can easily install. So this is not hard. No, no. And on the assembly line, it costs less than $100 to make a car dual fuel. So, so we can do the conversions for less than $300 typically and be running on either alcohol or gasoline or flip a switch and go between the two. So then the question is, how do we get ethanol uh, alcohol everywhere, so well, we've got it. And that's the crux, because the oil companies have a monopoly on the distribution system. So we have to get around that. And the way we do that, and we outline this in the book, it's very clever, is we shadow in behind the oil companies using all the advantages they've created over time for themselves to go ahead and form our own driver-owned alcohol stations. Because the oil companies have arranged a long time ago for local zoning to never really interfere with the placement of a fuel station. Any, commercial, any commercially zoned piece of land is usually suitable for an alcohol station. Okay. There are now above ground prepackaged alcohol stations that uh, you can buy that uh, can roll off the back of a truck, sit on the ground, plug in the electricity, and start selling fuel. So uh, we've designed one, for instance, that uh, runs on all solar energy and will fit in a 119 square foot space because in most That's counties in the tiny. United States, under 120 square feet does not require a building permit. So <sighs> you can just slip that thing right in there. Um, and it usually takes a little bit of work and organizing by people, but um, we can get our own alcohol station. And the reason why to do this as a driver owned profit making corporation is because there are tax credits that are available for alcohol fuel that really the oil companies are the only ones who collect. When they buy alcohol to blend with gasoline, they get 61 cents a gallon tax credit. Now, credit's not a deduction. A credit comes off your taxes. Deductions come off your income. Okay. So credits are more valuable. So if we want to get those credits as individuals, we have to own the station. We buy the alcohol, and then we sell it to ourselves as individuals. Sure, sure. So then we get the 61 cents a gallon. So we get to screw the oil companies and the IRS, which is really a good day <laughs> in my book. Now, uh, in setting up your alcohol station, there's actually a 30% tax investment credit, again, another credit, on the cost of setting up the station. So there are, And these, these incentives are buried in the tax code, and most people don't know they exist. But we as citizens can use those, and we can get the benefits that are currently going to oil companies. And um, because to try to stop us from getting them, they'd lose them, we go in under their radar. And so, you know, they're pretty well protected. Uh, and so in, in the book, we go ahead and explain how to make this revolution great. happen, starting That's with great. distribution. And then once you have your own alcohol distribution, you can start dictating and contracting with farmers how you want your fuel grown and processed. You want it organic, you, don't, you want it no GMO. You know, you can start mm -hmm, mm -hmm, ordering mm -hmm. up farmers to, to provide you with your fuel. And, you know, but once you have the distribution together, that's the key. And that's the bottleneck in the United States right now. In Brazil, where alcohol is available at the pump, it's half the price of gasoline. And starting this year in Brazil, uh, many auto companies no longer make gasoline-only models in Brazil. They've just given it up because nobody wants them. So having the choice is what matters, and I think our way of getting there is drive our own stations.
That is brilliant. Mm -hmm. May they spread like weeds all over mushrooms. America. Popping mushrooms up everywhere. Yes. In our last two minutes, what haven't we covered? Oh, well, goodness. I think I think you know the social aspects of alcohol. You know, where when you start looking at most of the world, the most important thing is not your car. I mean, most places in the world, you're looking at, you know, 15 people for every car. You yeah. know, unlike. Okay unless not like two cars for every person in the United States. Right. So, so when you look at other countries, you're looking at, for instance, deforestation. You know, people walk six hours to go collect enough wood to carry back home to cook for the week. You know, in many parts of the world, uh, there are programs now going in place where people can grow crops to grow, make alcohol, which is extremely energy dense. There's 80,000 BTU pound mm -hmm. per, per pound in alcohol, there's only 7,000 BTUs in wood. So a very small space will produce a lot of fuel, mm -hmm, and so people mm -hmm. can cook. And when you talk about wood fires, the amount of uh, eye injury and lung disease around the world, you know, is in the tens of millions of people, mm -hmm. mostly women and children, who are around these smoky hook fires. So socially, alcohol can stop re deforestation. Mm -hmm. The major cause is for cooking fuel and uh, replace it with absolutely clean alcohol. And a small amount of alcohol in a village means you can run a generator, which means you can have a refrigerator, which means health care gets greatly amplified for medicines that need refrigeration. Right, and right. all over Brazil, these are now sprouting. Alcohol-powered refrigerators, um, you know, alcohol cook stoves are being distributed, and all over Africa, this is beginning to be done too. Because, you know, the amount of energy you can get by producing alcohol dwarfs what you can make by growing wood. So it's, you know, it makes a big difference for that. Uh, in the United States, we can run generators at our homes that produce not only electricity for our home, but, you know, more than half of the energy goes as waste heat. And usually sure, that's sure. blown away in your radiator. So in the book, we talk about how you can take a normal engine, throw away the radiator and hook up a big water tank to it. And now it's your engine water. heats all your home's water as well as makes its electricity, and that's called cogeneration. Love it. So Love it. that businesses all over the United States are starting to install these to beat the high cost of utilities, because if you need both heat and water, now you're getting all the use out of the fuel. This is so, good. This and is... alcohol makes that very practical. So all of this is in the book. Thank you. This is wonderful. May it be a revolution, and may it really take place. Thank well, you. there's no doubt. We're already on the way. Thanks for being part of it. You're watching Peak Moment, Community Responses for a Changing Energy Future. I'm Jenea Donaldson. Join us next time.